<laughs> Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on his th the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching, scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And He will guide them to the springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for these words that we have today. These words that you give us an encouragement and missed your message on tribulation and trial and pain that you encourage us that we are sealed and taken into you. Lord, we ask your blessing upon our listening to this word and our study of this word. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Chapter 7 of the book of Revelation comes as kind of an interlude. Because in chapter 6, we had the beginning of the opening of the seals. And, and one seemed worse than the other. The calamities that would be visited, the tribulation that was to come, seemed one after another to be worse and worse. And there is a pause before opening up the seventh seal. And this pause here is placed in the opening between the six seals and the opening of the seventh seal as a reminder that God is in control. And that God has sealed and protected his believers. That doesn't mean protected from the trials and tribulations. The physical consequences of what the world is going through. As we read in the last seals, we had upheavals of people. We had upheavals of the earth and earthquakes. And all the upheavals that come with this tribulation is both a judgment on the people who persecute Christians. And also it is trials on the Christians' beliefs themselves. It brings out the ultimate safety from judgment that God's people have is in God and is sealed in the blessedness of those that have been martyred. 
it starts to tell us that what God will do for us believers during the time of tribulation. And the time of tribulation is this undefined period um, after the death and resurrection of Christ. Of course, we had the our prototype of what tribulation can, can really look like in the fall of Jerusalem that we studied at the beginning, and especially in the destruction of the temple and, and all that just horrible destruction of Jerusalem, which less than one-tenth of the people escaped from, and then only to go into slavery. So it's not a promise to believers to protect from the physical consequences of physical things of the tribulation, but rather it is a promise of spiritual protection. The sealing he promises enables us to respond in faith to the trials through which we will pass. We have to remember when John wrote this passage, it was a particularly tough time on the Jewish Christians. We sometimes with John will we'll get going button heads, Jews versus Christians, because he sometimes speaks derogatorily of the Jews, meaning really the Pharisees and the ones who are rejecting Christ, not Jewish people in general, as there were many Jewish Christians, of which John himself was one. But the Jewish Christians in particular were having an incredible struggle with persecution. The converts had not only to fear the Romans, but the converts, the Jewish Christian converts, had the greatest fear from their own people. And we saw that, of course, illustrated with Paul as he was given letters to persecute believers in the way that the Christians throughout Israel, and he was headed to Damascus, the road to Damascus. He was headed to Damascus to persecute believers in the way, the new Christians at that time. We have to remember that the first persecutors of the Christian church, which we see right in the, and especially in the book of Acts when we see it, were those legalistic Jews who had rejected Christ. Today, we see how eager the world is to pick up on hate. We've seen that with Israel just here lately, as not only is there the struggles that they have in their own country with their enemies there, we see the people all over the world persecuting much harder the Jews in their nations. We see it in the paper every day of people persecuting the Jews. The rising of the hatred of them has been terrible. It has been an absolutely horrible thing to see. And it doesn't only apply to Jews, but also to Christians in general. And Christians have also seen an increase in persecution and rejection. Now we know from reading the history of, uh, that the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem fled before Rome conquered it. They had fled to the mountains. They had gotten the message. They had fled out of it. And also from the seven churches letters, we know that this means we don't compromise with the world. Both believers and unbelievers suffer from the havoc of those first seals that were opened. Of the tribulation and the trial, we both suffer. They suffer in judgment. We suffer through a trial of to, to show that we will not compromise our faith. They are there to purify God's servants. And at the same time, they harden the hearts of the ungodly in their response to God. We see people, the more that the truth comes out, the more some people stand shaking their fist at God Himself. We see it again and again. So our yasin, and I'm pronouncing it as close as I can, is the Greek word for seal used here, and it has this sense of protection. But it also has the meaning to authenticate or to designate ownership of. God is claiming us here as His own. 
not just one group of people, but multitudes of people from all the nations he claims as his own. He gives us his spiritual protection so we can stand for him as the world crumbles around us. Because the real dangers to Christians during the tribulation is not the prospect of physical suffering, is not the prospect of, of economic hardship that is promised, it's not those things. The real tribulation, the real danger of it to the believers is the pressure to compromise our faith. We saw that in the very beginning of the, the book of Revelation in the letters to the seven churches some of which were already falling away from God because of letting in compromise of their faith. I was watching a show last night, and in the show there was a young man who was, if he had just made this compromise, he, he was getting ready to lose his license for his restaurant for two months because he served a minor in his restaurant. He served a minor alcohol in his restaurant. He was going to be suspended for two months and he was given an easy out that would have had him compromise his values. And he took it and he says, and someone, one of the young ladies and says, why don't you just do this? It would make it easier. And he says, if I do it once, it makes it easier to compromise again. Mm -hmm. That's the difficulty with compromise. When you compromise once, it makes it easier and easier to compromise again. That's why we are to reject compromise in our faith. The tribulation we experience, the trials that we experience, come directly because of our faithful witness of Christ. As I said, I, I didn't pick it particularly before Revelation, but I'm so glad we did Peter uh, two letters of Peter before Revelation because they were so much letting us know that we are going to be persecuted for our faith. And they were living in a time when they were really seeing it. The Roman world was increasingly persecuting the Christians at the time. And we see it now. The world is increasingly persecuting Christians because of their faith. I saw an article just the other day that said Christians need to quit rel relying on their faith to make their judgments in society. Well, that's exactly what we don't need to be doing. We do show love to everyone, whether we would agree with them or not, because we are, of course, our ultimate hope is they become brothers and sisters in Christ to us. But we don't compromise our faith in doing so. We draw our red line in the sand, so to speak. We will not go over this. We will show you our love, but we're not going to endorse your lifestyle. We're not going to endorse what you do. We're not going to celebrate things that we know are wrong just because society tells us that's what the new wave is. We will not compromise our beliefs. Because as I was saying... The idea of the seal means we belong to Christ. That he's not just our Savior, he's our Lord. And when he's our Lord, that means we take what he says and what scripture says seriously. He's not just some comfy, warm, soft security blanket. He is our Lord and Master. We serve him and we serve him even when it makes us uncomfortable. In fact, that's the times we're called to serve him even harder. I always go back every once in a while to Jonathan Edwards because I, I love Jonathan Edwards, his resolutions of, of his faith. And the one that always stuck out with me is when given more than one opportunity to serve God, choose the hardest. Choose the one someone else won't choose. Get down in the trenches. And, and this man who was a, by any account, a genius and, and preached in some of the most incredible areas, went and preached the gospel to uneducated Indians because he knew that's what God called him to do. It was something others didn't want to do. He was called to do it. When we go back and we look at some of the, the technical aspects of this passage, 
One of the things that is, of course, is the 144,000 of Israel sealed. It's a symbolic number to emphasize the church in its entirety. And it, 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 goes, between, it goes from that, of course, to the multitudes. The whole multitude before, from many nations and languages that stand before the throne, all those that washed in the blood of Christ are redeemed. It's not just some special group of martyrs that is redeemed here. Nor are they a last generation of believers living at the end of the age. They are the entirety of the church body worshiping in heaven. And I, my belief is the reason why it is given a specific number in the tribal thing is to let us know that God has our number. He knows our number. He knows the exact number of us that He is sealing and preserving and redeeming. And then the multitude to show that from the human perspective, it is just an incredible number and of different peoples that come together in God. There is no separation between Jewish and Gentile Christians that is being expressed here. We can see that in just looking at the continuity of John and saying that Jew and Christian are one. That we're one tree, that we are one... Uh, Plant that we are gathered together. We have been grafted together, but we're not a different tree. We're a one tree. That we have been joined together in Christ. And this is all the servants of God. And this divine seal that is marked upon their foreheads, it's not something other Christians will see. It's not something that's going to be visible to the world. And I think that the, what it is letting us see here is the seal is the Holy Spirit. The seal is the Holy Spirit that is within us. And it empowers us to remain faithful and uncompromising in the culture. To stand strong for God as the tribulation rages. It protects us also, the Holy Spirit, the seal protects us from the final days of judgment. And I think that is what it is mostly clearly identified with, the Holy Spirit. It comes to us and it strengthens us when we receive or recognize God's salvation. The ceiling here is listed by tribes. And one of the interesting things is he mentions Judah first. And nowhere else will you find in the mention of the tribes Judah first. But here is Judah first. Probably because John is looking at it from a messianic point of view. He's looking at it from that messianic, from Jesus' point of view. It's not a literal number. You know, at the time that this was written, there were already ten lost tribes that had been missing for centuries. And the destruction of the southern kingdom. And here, even Judah and Benjamin would lose their identity in 70 AD. The tribal identity has been lost. But John has already in this book alone identified again and again the true believers of all nations as God's people. As the ones called by God. No separation, but all one together. Both the immediate context of the scripture, enlisting the, the 144,000, enlisting the multitudes, and the broad context of John points to the tribes transferring as identification to the new church. He's already applied the label of Israel to the church multiple times, and to suddenly try to read this as a real number from each tribe I think it just goes beyond what the biblical evidence and the evidence in John portrays. It is one group portrayed in two different symbolic ways. The number to show that God has our number, knows our number, and the multitude to emphasize that the multitude that God has his claim on many nations and many cultures. One of the things that I began with when we started the study of Revelation was the incredible change in Africa from having about 10 million Christians to about 300 million Christians in a fairly short time frame. 
One time makes the next time easier when it comes to compromise. Faith in one way, then in one way we compromise it in a hundred ways. We are called not to compromise. The end of tribulation was set off with, excuse me, the end time tribulation was set off with the death of Christ on the cross. The execution of our design Messiah. And all of us are called to imitate His example of perseverance through our trials. And the reason we can persevere is because death could not hold our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the whole reason. That's the reason we gather here is that death could not hold our Lord Jesus Christ. He defeated it to free us from the fear of it. Our goal is, of course, to be amongst those that have washed their clothes white in the blood of the Lamb, meaning we depend upon His righteousness. We serve Him entirely. We stand before the throne and we escape final judgment. We have been signed, sealed, and delivered so that we can withstand the tribulation that occurs within our lifetime, whether this is the end of the age in our lifetime, or whether it is just the tribulation that we suffer in our times because tribulation has existed since the death and resurrection of Christ. The apostles have done their duty. The redeemed here of humanity and the heavenly host praise God and the Lamb for the salvation that they have accomplished. They have done their duty. They have spread the word of God to all people. And we are called to respond. This is a chapter that is dedicated to the sealing of Christ. It's a sign and seal for all that walk in Christ. And from my favorite hymn, The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. We will have that seal upon us no matter what happens to us in the tribulation. The body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. Let us pray. Most Heavenly Father, as we struggle through the increasing persecution we see, and especially persecution for those who stand and make a stand and voice you as the truth, the way, and the life, we ask for your strength for us to be able to stand against it. That we have your seal. That the Holy Spirit is within us. We have the words to say when we need to say them. We have the strength to say it. Help us, Lord, to stand for you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.